I'm uh, new to the study of ayahuasca, but not new to the study of addictions. Uh, 37 years in the field, and I just feel to make a contribution in this area by bringing some of that experience uh, into this context. Um, and I, it's late, so I also want to thank you for being here. You're either hardcore addiction researchers or clinicians, or you're hardcore ayahuasca researchers or clinicians, or both. So thank you for, for staying. So without further ado, let me figure out how to do this. You can see the title. I thought a lot about what I could contribute. And um, I framed the title this way. Uh, what do the prevailing models and methods of uh, alcohol and drug uh, treatment and treatment research, what can they bring to the study of uh, ayahuasca and its therapeutic potential? But also, I'd like you to think about uh, the reverse of that, which I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about. What does the study of ayahuasca uh, what is the potential to bring to the study of alcohol and drug treatment in other contexts? I think that's a more reciprocal way to look at uh, the work that we face. Okay. Okay. Nope. Yep. Yep. Ah. I guess uh, also by way of introduction while we're getting started, I'm not a, uh, a psychiatrist, a clinician, a physician. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so I bring a, a public health perspective to this as well, which I think is interesting to see how we can contribute uh, to something kind of in a clinical context, but also both aware of the potential risks in a public health context, but as you'll see, I'm going to just raise questions for you about the role of ayahuasca in treating the full spectrum or, or supporting the full spectrum of uh, substance use and abuse, including its role in prevention. Um, from Canada, so this is kind of a Canadian afternoon uh, with our colleagues, so uh, I'm from Toronto. We are on the cusp of being in the Stanley Cup playoffs for the first time in the last century, it feels. Uh, so we do play hockey, and we are a very multicultural society. I thought I would just point that out, because everything I'm going to talk about, including the use of ayahuasca in its therapeutic context, is really all about um, cultural context. So this is a little bit of my cultural context. So I'm going to start just the, the way the presentation is organized. What are some of the things we've learned uh, from the study of alcohol and drugs and treatment? And then what are some of the implications of that for the study of uh, the therapeutic potential for ayahuasca? So the first thing we've learned over the last while is that the treatment system, and, and I'll go on to describe what I mean by that, um, really needs to address the full spectrum. Um, it doesn't exist in an either-or phenomenon, not like the good and bad spirits, Jacques. Uh, alcohol and drug use in the community exists along a full spectrum, and we now see the need to see how uh, the specialized services for the treatment of addictions actually uh, can be distributed through the community to address the full spectrum of risk. And this asks us to look at the relationship between treatment and prevention. And to point out, the, the afternoon has been about uh, the use of ayahuasca for treatment, but uh, just as a reminder, uh, in many cultures it's used in a prevention context, and we should also have that in mind. It's not the focus for today necessarily, but the children are the future. This is a, what's often referred to as a population health pyramid. Um, many people who are coming into alcohol and drug treatment, and for sure, uh, my visit to Takiwasi, the people coming to the center are really very severe and quite complex. But we have to recognize that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, these people emerge from uh, history 
uh, of use and abuse. And if we think about uh, Gabor Mate's presentation, a history of, of a wide range of trauma. So there's a, there's a personal trajectory often here. Um, but most of the people are here. If we put some numbers on that in the Canadian context, and if you have the right epidemiological data, you can do this in most of the developed countries. Um, this is really a very small percentage of the, of the overall population, whereas most of the people are here. And then if we ask what percentage of these people are actually going for help related to their alcohol and drugs, here very few people go for help, but even here most of the people with very, very severe problems are not going for help. The emerging view in the alcohol and drug treatment literature is that this kind of microsystem of alcohol and drug and mental health services is just not sufficient to address this population. It's just not big enough and not enough people are going for help. So the emerging view is that these services need to be working in concert with other health services. There's a wide range of collaborative care models and this is the system of support for those folks. Schools, workplace, um, the uh, social assistance, I've added spiritual resources, most people would not put them there, I'll come back to that point. Traditional healing, most people would not put them there, but I'll come back to that point. So this is the alcohol and drug treatment system. That picture looks quite different in many countries. This is the system of healing, and you can see I added question marks here, because in some communities, uh, in developing countries, low-income countries, there's really very little of this, and there's really only this. So the implications, alternative healing needs to be recognized as a legitimate part of the community treatment system. And I say that's a fundamental principle, whether you're in downtown Oakland, uh, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, Toronto, Inuktitut in our Arctic, there are community healers there. There are people doing a lot of good work, but they are generally not seen as part of our healthcare system. We need to consider the role of ayahuasca and other plant medicine for prevention and early intervention. And this one is a big challenge. We need to see the treatment centers as part of this system, but they need to be linked. Uh, you heard from Anya, um, Gabor, everyone talking today that um, ayahuasca is not a panacea, but also for this, the treatment of addiction, it needs to be connected to some follow-up. So it's raising the question, what is the relationship of the retreats, uh, of residential centers, even like Takiwasi? What is the relationship for discharge? Where are those people going? And, and, and uh, what's the connection when they go back home? So lesson learned number two, the paradigm of treatment, the paradigm of addiction, drives obviously the design of the intervention, but the design of the intervention will drive the choice of evaluation. There is no one paradigm has been shown to be uh, superior in guiding the development and evaluation of treatment. Indeed, these paradigms are essentially competing with each other. We don't have time to go into this. I think this is very similar to the slide that Jacques showed, um, different ways to explain addiction. These paradigms lead to different kinds of interventions, different focus, the structure of the treatment, the interaction between the person. The point I'm trying to make is that the paradigm drives the intervention. That's not news. But what's the question is whether there's enough acceptance here to accept a spiritual paradigm for treatment of addictions, to be successful in getting funding, to be successful in moving the project forward. Of course, the sentence has 
three errors because the sentence itself is incorrect. In other words, you will see what you look for. Um, we do have, I think, a biopsychosocial, but sometimes we have to whisper the word spiritual, biopsychosocial, spiritual, <laughs> paradigm for treatment. It's like putting it in brackets in the grant. So the dynamics of a paradigm shift, and I won't dwell here, but the, what, where this is leading is that I do not think we can evaluate ayahuasca, its therapeutic potential, without including a spiritual component. Paradigm shift when something is not going well. But we do have dominant paradigms, and there's often a competition to get space for particular models or measures. These are the two fundamental goals of a treatment system. Coverage, and remember that even the most severe problems, people do not go for help. So coverage is a major problem. But also quality, even well-funded, well-resourced uh, uh, programs uh, still struggle to get very successful rates, especially with the kinds of people Gabor Matu is seeing in the downtown east side and what I think is going to Takawasi. So a competing paradigm must contribute and improve upon uh, those two goals. Will a spirituality-based approach grow and be supported? Yes, if it improves coverage. In other words, it will not be supported if we are only seeing um, a very, very small number of people and if the results are not really good. No one will pay any attention if you don't solve those two problems. So the implications, we need to be open to multiple perspectives. We need to fit the measures to the model. Spirituality needs a place in the measurement model. And we don't have time to go into it here, but almost everything I say may not be true for the evaluation of indigenous programs. It needs its own paradigm and its own model. So lesson learned number three, no one type of therapeutic intervention has been shown to be superior. It's basically different strokes for different folks. What are the factors related to improvement? 40% of the variance in treatment outcome is related to what the person brings, their severity, their context, their, their family, their community. 15% is related to what we will do with them. And this is quite humbling for people. 15% or so is based on expectancy. And 30% is based on having a good relationship. So it's very difficult to find the one best technique because you're really only operating with a small percentage of the variance. <clears throat> And it's also important to note that while there's lots of room for new approaches, there are some common elements that relate to therapeutic relationship, belief, expectancies, and so on. And this calls for a holistic approach to the evaluation, something I think similar to what um, has been promoted through all of the presentations today. It cannot be biological alone. It cannot be psychological alone. It cannot be social alone. These things need a holistic model. So the implications, treatment with ayahuasca needs to be seen in a stepped care model. In some case, it could be the initial stepping stone and needing some extended treatment. Um, back to what Gabor was saying, it may be a second stage intervention. In other words, it's not just one approach. It needs to be part of a continuing care model. Long-term residential ayahuasca-assisted treatment may be effective, but it needs to be reserved for the most severe. Lesson learned number five. What actually is evidence-based practice? What standards of evidence are being held up for us? They're pretty high, but are they really appropriate? Um, the, the literature around EBPs, as they're called, evidence-based practice, is evolving, and we're now distinguishing between practice and the process, in this case, the actual intervention from the process of delivering it. 
We also hear language coming out of the, the study of indigenous practices, in particular here in the United States, um, formal definitions of practice-based evidence and community-defined evidence. And we're likely to find some support there in um, moving work in the area of ayahuasca forward if we're looking to that literature and the success that the uh, American Indians and uh, our indigenous people in Canada they, and in New Zealand in particular are being very successful in promoting their work and getting funding for their programs by redefining evidence. There's also work underway in the evaluation field. Um, for some people this is a bit of a no-brainer, but think about it. Intervention plus context equals outcome. There's a whole range of new methodologies being developed for synthesizing literature and so on. So for sure, and I guess following up on the last presentation in particular, there's a need to build upon the existing database, uh, our, our existing knowledge. There's a need to learn from the progress being made in other indigenous healing practices. And this is something I've really had to deal with myself. Uh, we need to resist, or at least carefully consider, our tendency to deconstruct the ayahuasca experience. We have a strong therapeutic relationship there. We have, in a shamanic context or a religious context, we have a group experience. We have belief. We have a, a, a biological component. So our first inclination is to want to kind of pull that apart. But that's just how our Western brain kind of thinks. Um, I've been advised by others to, to not go there right now, but to try to study the experience in its totality and also to make sure we're still uh, focused somewhat on toxicity. So bringing it all to bear, um, I'm a health services guy. This is natural for me to say, okay, small-scale clinical studies are one thing, but I think it's time or maybe time to kind of kick it up a notch and, and what I describe as a health services agenda, placing ayahuasca-assisted treatment uh, in a larger context of, of a health service, not small-scale cl clinical studies. So one approach are really finding people in the community who are not in contact with any formal services. Uh, and there are methodologies available that we can do this. I think we need to understand why they're using ayahuasca and also what benefits they're getting and what, how they're complementing that experience. Uh, secondly, and it's a study I'll describe very quickly, what we call a panel study, or a, uh, some might use the word descriptive, but it's an, uh, not controlled, it's a, not a randomized controlled trial. I don't think we're there, but I think we can do larger scale studies following people up, uh, looking at uh, a variety of outcomes, and also understanding the context in which ayahuasca is being used. So we have a project uh, in development. We are not funded yet. It's a multi-center study that's being planned to describe various approaches, the outcomes being achieved, and their context. At present, the three countries involved are Peru, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, we're a few of us here to keep talking about this. Um, we are proposing a common baseline description using uh, validated assessment tools. At this point, it's not likely to be the ASI. Um, we have another option that we're looking at. But whatever tool we use needs to have its outcome measures embedded in that. So it's a common, quote unquote, clinical assessment across a number of centers and a number of countries. Um, one or two year follow up, this will depend a lot on funding. So it would be a quantitative assessment of outcomes. This is the tool we're looking at. We're now translating that into Portuguese and, and Spanish. This would be the range of measures. Uh, some of them in the gain, the spirituality-based outcomes. Um, I've done my own literature review on that, and I've got to stack this high, so nobody can tell me there's no spiritually-based research being done. You have to look in uh, social work and other branches. Uh, for example, in cancer care, they're studying um, uh, end-of-life kinds of work and so on. There's a qualitative narrative component that will be needed. 
We are open to explore other uh, uh, innovative evaluation techniques, but essentially it's a clinical study uh, done in a naturalistic settings. There's a variety of challenges. Um, one I've been thinking about here, I appreciate kind of feedback on, and we're going to be talking about in the group. Um, some people are coming, I don't know if this is the right word, but are we talking about the treatment of uh, local people? Or are we talking about the treatment of people who've come from Europe or North America um, into a Latin American context? And should we separate them in some way? Uh, should we have two different samples? I'm not sure, but I think it's different in some way. Uh, the belief system, the expectancies, everything are going to be different for that population. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, Jacques was good enough to introduce me to Shasha and uh, Riniwasi and Buenos Aires. Uh, they use ayahuasca in the context of uh, mental health generally, not just addictions. So is our study about addictions, is our study about something, something broader. Um, there are a wide range of infrastructure requirements. To do this in one center is difficult enough, but to do it, for example, in the Amazon, if we find a place, uh, do we need an infrastructure for not just paper and pencils, computers, uh, data quality, monitoring, fidelity um, of the interventions and the, and the uh, data collection, sample size, uh, Jacques will be the first to admit, Takiwasi is uh, how many people a year? 50. So we need uh, three or four times that. The, the power in these studies is in the numbers and for statistical controls and statistical manipulation. It's how you can kind of get away, sort of, uh, without a control group. Uh, but you need numbers to do that. We will be able to compare the data, depending on the measure we choose, to international benchmarks of outcome. So it's not completely uncontrolled, it's not completely observational. Um, and the other one I, I think I should have uh, thought to put on is that only in Peru is it really wide open and legal, unless we did include Colombia, I suppose. So is there some risk to the centers to be involved? Um, how are we going to get approval? If we looked at the Canadian example that was presented today, it's an observational study, so maybe we don't need all those approvals. But in each case, we have people associated with the university. We need an ethics review. So it's a little complicated, the logistics about it. And I had lunch with Anya uh, today to talk about that and some of the pros and cons maybe of involving Mexico, which we'll talk about as a group. So I think that's it. Um, right now it's a staged approach. We, are, we got caught up in trying to get funding from Sanaj in uh, Brazil, which ran into its own problems and its own kind of drug wars at the moment. So we are still unfunded, but uh, I, I think we've got a variety of funding options we will now pursue um, either in Brazil or Peru through kind of traditional government uh, research funding. Um, especially for the first meeting, which is not going to be super expensive. We just need to come together to really finalize the protocol. Uh, we may have other philanthropic options, and I'm starting to consider using uh, crowdfunding through the Internet because it's really not that much money. If, if the 1,600 people enrolled in MAPS each contributed 10 bucks, we're halfway there. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, good luck in your own personal work. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, question. Yeah, I have two uh, questions. First question, in Canada, are you aware, I, I'm from Arizona and then in New Mexico, they're having like traditional healing consult team in, in Gallup, New Mexico, in the Navajo area in the hospital. Does that kind of thing exist in Canada? Um, not to my knowledge, an indigenous healer working in the context yeah, of the center. That's what I, I've come across. Um, that they have a, like a hogan now, you know, in the back, and then they can the patient can ask to participate. So I'm just wondering. That's an interesting kind of thing that's not, happening. Not oh. in Ontario. Canada is a big country, and sure. the, if it's happening, it would be happening probably in Saskatchewan or Alberta, where the indigenous population is larger. Got it. Um, we were close to hiring an indigenous, very spiritually oriented psychiatrist at our center, but mm -hmm. at the end, it didn't. I think they were just uh, not brave enough. 
Hmm. But so I think the answer is not. Okay. There's good relationships, but not in-house. Okay. Indigenous support. And then the, the next thing is is you know I have my center there, New Era Centro Espiritual, in the middle of Peru. With the MD, we have computers and stuff. We love to participate in. That yeah, I was study, happy so. to meet you. We have to talk. Yeah, and I'm sure you have a. You, you, if you guys want to schmooze me, you know, and take me out, or you know. <laughs> no, but we want to participate. I do. Yeah. But Ray, I, it was during it was during your presentation that I started to wonder about the challenges, including uh, are we talking about local people, mestizos, or indigenous people from Peru, for example, or your family from Norway is it's a different context but it, we right. should talk yeah well we're fo I mean just so you know I mean our focus is to do our tourism you know we're that we're treating foreigners because that's how we can run a sustainable business I understand and I think it is an intriguing model because that would apply here these are the individuals yeah next question thanks a lot Brian um, when in, when we uh, finished our, our study with the uh, Canadian First Nations, we started thinking about what the challenges might be in moving on to a clinical research, and I'm so glad to hear that you're looking at those challenges. But one of them that, that was tough to work around was whether how to deal with um, dose response issues, a standardized dose, et cetera. It was clear that none of the Iowskeros that we worked with wanted to use the freeze-dried version of ayahuasca. And otherwise, if you're doing a long-term clinical uh, study with, with hundreds of participants, you almost need to make one huge dose and have that either frozen or otherwise uh, be able to make sure you, everyone's getting a similar product, not because we think it makes a difference in bioavailability, but because for the scientific community it will. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, there may be some of those things we need to try. I don't think for this project we go there. I think it's part of the descriptive thing. What, where is it made? Uh, what is the dosage, uh, et cetera? How is it being used is more of interest right now. I think at another stage is more of a controlled kind of research thing. And then, as many people in the room will know, you can have the same tea in the same cup in the same room with five different people, and it's all different. And it's going to be different tomorrow. Thank so you. even controlling the, the, the substance is not controlling the experience. But I think it's for the credibility of the work in another stage. I think we do have to go there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, very interesting talk. So, trying to think about the cultural context in Canada with the, the work with the First Nations. I mean, this is a context in which addiction is intimately linked with ongoing colonial violence, with dispossession, and with questions of sovereignty. And to talk about translation of aims to translation of, of outcomes. How can we kind of think about that and also kind of complicate the way in which spirit is being deployed in this context? I mean, to kind of echo Max Weber even and, and Slavo Žižek, mm -hmm. the, the relation between a liberal capitalism and spirit and the way in which that's being deployed in this context where really what we're trying to heal from is an ongoing colonization. Yeah, these are all good issues and we wouldn't dream to go too far without a lot more consultation with our First Nations population. We have the one project in BC where they followed a really good process, uh, but that's one small community in Western Canada. I'm working with a group at a more national level uh, reviewing culture-based uh, intervention. We're going through a systematic review of culture-based intervention for Indigenous people. I've put your, it was nice to have the publication in press, at least put that there. So the issue of Indigenous plants from the South being used in a cultural context in the North, it's emerging as a discussion point, but it's not, not quite there yet. I think it's a very serious topic. Um, you can have a lot of perspectives. My own is it, it's maybe too early and, and it's not the right time to introduce it, but it's there anyway. <laughs> so I appreciate the question a lot. I'm just curious in regards to substance abuse, what are the three top addictions that you treat uh, normally? 
I'm sorry, just do one more time for me. In regards to substance abuse, and what are the three top addictions that you normally treat? Like, is it heroin, in cocaine, Canada, alcohol? It depends a little bit on the province and, the, and also urban versus rural. Uh, alcohol is still top of the list. Prescription opiates are emerging as number two. In our treatment centers in Ontario, it's 60, 70,000 people per year. Um, prescription opiates have now outpaced cocaine as the drug of abuse coming into treatment. So if you just get your head around that, it's a little bit scary. Um, cannabis is also very high, but we look a little bit suspiciously at the statistics because many are young people that have been kind of moved there either from the criminal justice system or uh, the school system. So it's not necessarily in treatment, the kind of in the treatment program, but there are still, there are many people in treatment for cannabis related problems, seriously. So alcohol, cannabis, and now prescription opiates would be the top three. But that's kind of on a large scale. In, in Vancouver, crystal meth and, and opiates and you name it, it's a pharmacy, downtown east side. Okay, we're right at six o'clock, so I'd like okay, to thank, thank Brian again.